Our discussion here today is on Iceland's sustainability strategy and what we call the 100% fish. We'll have a panel with interesting people here later on and another keynote all about this idea of being more sustainable in our, in our seafood industry. To begin with, I would like to uh, switch this here. Oh, it does? Okay. Tell you a little bit what's interesting is that we could say that the evolution in the seafood industry has been so drastic in only a fairly short period of time. Of course, what we've, we saw in the, in the 19th century was quite different from, from what it is now, but what's happening in this short time frame now, just in the last 10 years, maybe 20 years max, is so significant. That's basically the story that I want to tell you. How we are changing the seafood industry, of course, knowing from the beginning that it is the most, most efficient way, one of the most efficient ways of, of, of producing food, but we can do even better. I will show examples of that. Let's start with the ships. What's happening with our designs in the, in, the, in the vessels is basically that we're seeing drastic changes. If we would look 10, 15 years back, we're talking about 50% less fuel. Now, only in the last two or three years, we're seeing designs still in the, in the uh, diesel uh, machines saving 20 to 30%, now moving into methane, into electricity. That's probably our biggest threshold still to get the CO2 down is to work on that, but we are on it. We're also seeing the transportation, which is a significant thing here. The transportation is actually becoming more and more CO2, uh, less CO2 than it was in the past. We're also finding new, more natural resources um, being exported uh, with, with uh, fresh fish for, for a longer shelf life due to both better transportation, but also due to new technology in that field. But the most drastic change comes actually from a company that's going to be presenting later on here, from Marel, from another company, Skagen, old companies in Iceland as well, where we are doing uh, amazing things in terms of the efficiency of, of processing the fish. And this is basically the reason why we're still processing fish in some of the wealthiest countries in the world. So it's such a key to the whole thing so that we don't have to be sending, exporting our fish raw to, to other countries and importing it again, filleted. So this is absolutely crucial for us to continue on this track to make sure that we are on our way to a, a better and more sustainable uh, future. But the other thing also which I am very pleased with in Iceland is that we're having a, a, so many now in our small island so many new techs. Some of them will be presented here in the panel. We also have uh, companies that are just one or two persons now, but with great ideas. And I just would like to emphasize here, as a, as a cluster uh, founder, that the whole idea has to be based on people. So we're finding new innovators, new startups, young people that are coming with new ideas. Just some examples on the, of the heroes now in the new generation coming, people that are doing uh, herding fish with lights, using new technology to cool the fish, new technology on board boats so we can have actually windmills on board some of the vessels instead of using other types of fuel. So electric boats as well. And so the whole thing is based on people and we have to emphasize that in all our work, it, is never, it, it will never be better than the people behind these tax. So what, what I wanted to emphasize also is basically what's happening in only 10, mostly in the last 10 years in Iceland. This is what we call the boom. The boom of taking these byproducts of ours, which most nations actually define as waste, and say there is no waste. There is absolutely no waste in the seafood industry. It is ridiculous to de define any part of the fish as waste because these are some of the best proteins, the sustainable, natural, traceable proteins in the world. We should use all of them, and that's what we've done. This is why we can call ourselves the Silicon Valley of the fish in the world. If you look at it in the year 2000, we had the fillets, some canning, some drying, moving further up, and in a very short period of time, you see the picture absolutely filled the biggest heroes there now are, of course, Keresis, which will be joining us in the panel here with Skincraft, 
And it's just so amazing, especially for me as an economist, to know for one fillet of, of cod, we can probably get, let's say, 15 to $20. But for the skin, done the Keras's way, we can get $4,700. And it's, it makes the whole thing quite different. And I, I'm just very pleased to say that we are being, we can double or triple or do more than that, the value of the industry. This means also that villages, villages all around the coastal areas, not least in the US, in North America, Europe as well, elsewhere, we can create opportunities for young people as well. So that's basically our message here today, is that this is what we can do. And once again, it's all a matter of realizing that there are people behind it. Here we have some of the leaders in, in both the collagen uh, industry in Iceland, where we are taking the fish skin, creating collagen, which is then put into the boost all around the world. Uh, we have also people that are doing, the Caresis team is there. There are people doing new things with the fish oil. They're actually taking the fish oil nearly fresh now from the cod and squeezed it into a bottle. Uh, that's the only, the oil in Iceland that we call the extra virgin fish oil. So we're kind of proud of sort of trying, trying out new ideas. So we are actually saying this is the 100% cod, but we can do it whatever, with so many other products. And I was super pleased to visit American Seafood yesterday, get on board and see how the enthusiasm there is just the same to take the 100% approach there, which is so crucial for the industry here as everywhere else. Thing that's growing the fastest now in Iceland is of course fish uh, farming, both offshore and onshore. This is not with uh, environmental risks, so we are taking careful steps in that, but the, the thing that we want to do better, the, even better than our Scandinavian friends that actually started the whole thing, our Norwegian friends started the, the sort of the, the real fish farming in Iceland, is to create better circumstances in terms of the, the processing. Today, in most countries, 20 to 40 percent of the salmon is actually thrown away used as waste. And people are, we are saying in Iceland, we have the technology now to do all the parts of the salmon as well. And I'm just showing some examples of the products that we can do from the salmon and create value. And keep in mind, these are huge amounts. In the world, we expect this to be around 10 million metric tons of byproducts or co-products of fish that are actually used for landfill. And still, it's only a matter of mindset. People still think this is the way to go because this is waste. There is no such thing. The good thing is, though, that we are seeing now a global movement of 100% fish. Once again, meeting with the, uh, the American seafood, seeing how they are displaying their Pollock, 100% Pollock is one example. But we're seeing it all around. So we're hoping, Icelanders, that we actually ten, can take this ideology and just export it all around. They were open for it wherever it comes from. Just to show you examples, California, we've, we've been working with Californians on 100% tuna. Great example of things that we can do even in a small tuna industry in California. One of my pride now is working with the Canadians and the Americans with Lake Whitefish. 50,000 tons, huge opportunities to do much more with the fish. They are showing themselves what we're doing today and what they hope to do with the fish once again creating interesting jobs for young people that can move into the industry again with, with uh, all kinds of products that are valuable to the markets. Same as with even Namibia. We're working with Namibians on finding ways to develop more products from uh, the products that they previously defined as waste. Maine is working on 100% lobster where to work on 100% lobster if it isn't in Maine. So that's just a one example. What's so great is that we have actually a cluster there as well, sister cluster in, in Maine. And suddenly there is a company now called Marine Skin Care that is taking the lobster shells in good collaboration with the industry and now selling in, Boston, in the Boston area and the whole Massachusetts, state of Massachusetts, new skin care product made from the, from the lobster shells that are, have been thrown away in the past. We have also done the, what we call the incredible fish value machine, basically saying this is the way to go, zero waste. And what's so good now is that we've been finding in Connecticut, a cluster there, 
doing cash value machines similar to ours. So I think this attitude is coming. There is, a, there is a drastic change happening only right now. We need this movement to continue, so keep on, keep on working on that. But in, in generally speaking, what we see as the growth opportunities in Iceland is quite interesting, I think, because the, the wild cat is going to be there, of course, and we're proud of it. We have the highest numbers of cert certifications for our cats on a global scale, and we tend to be doing things quite well, taking the CO2 down, but the growth is in various other sectors. Here are the morals of Iceland, which we expect actually to nearly be close to the operating uh, turnover of the, the seafood industry in, in not a long time. We will also have there all kinds of other companies, whether it is fleet management, tracking, all kinds of companies that we'll talk about a little bit later here as well. But we see also fish farming as a growth opportunity. We need to be careful there, but definitely there will be growth in that as well. But once again, we need to be careful with that. Finally, the 100% is growing quite drastically. And only the, the example of Keresis that we knew that we were talking about, this is a company that actually uses 0.04% of the quota in Iceland of caught one out of 2,500. It is becoming the most, one of the most valuable seafood company in Iceland, employing 500 employees. And I promise you, there will be much more of those. Biotechnology is taking over because people are realizing that seafood is also the best protein in the world. It's the natural protein. It has the huge opportunities for healing, and we will, we will discuss that later on. Just to mention also, one of the things that we always forget is that we are this nation that is sometimes not mentioned because we're not sort of always on the map. I would like the governor to have mentioned Reykjavik. Just tell him next time, Reykjavik is also a capital in the Nordic, and Iceland is as well. So, but what's happening is that these companies that I'm talking about, world leaders now, are coming from small villages in Iceland. This is a company, Keresis, that I've been talking about in a small village in the west coast of Iceland, founded there. Fishermen, a company now in a town with a population of 200, with now tourists of 20,000 people that are coming to see the fishermen concept in, in this small town of ours in, in the West Shores as well. Primex now, world leader in extracting kytosan from shrimp shells, also from the northern part of Iceland, small town there. We can do this, this does not have to be all done in large cities. We can do this on a small scale, but there is a need for a new mindset which understands the value of sustainability and the circular economy and takes and appreciates the startups that are the driving force in this year. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Anna. Uh, I'm here representing one of the companies that Thor was just talking about, called Marel. Uh, we recently celebrated our 40th anniversary. And it's always very good when you are celebrating 40-year anniversary to look back on what has been going so well and look also forward. Where are we going to be in the next 40 years? Uh, Marl is a company that is uh, founded in Iceland in one of the student rooms in University of Iceland. And it was incorporated in 1983. We are all about transforming the way food is processed. And we are very proud of uh, starting and initiating our business in fish, working in partnership with fish customers, uh, developing all kinds of machinery that is used in Fishing, fish processing, and not only machinery, because we have been expanding. And now I uh, would say the focus is more and more on software and optimizing what we are doing in our processing. 
What has been a red thread, because I was talking about looking back, when you have been 40 years in the business, what has been going well and what should we continue? And there are two items that I think we need to highlight and need to continue, uh, not only in Marel, but in fish processing generally throughout. One is sustainability. The company of Marel is just founded around the business idea uh, of sustainability. Do not throw away food. This is something that we are all taught when we are young. Do not uh, like, yeah, do not uh, play with food and do not throw away food. This is something that is so engraved into the genes of, uh, uh, of many of us that this is something that was then used again into this business, uh, making sure that we maximize yield and we minimize waste. And this is something that we have to continue because sustainability is just the business also of the future. Second part is innovation. And innovation is what this company was founded on and is also what we have partnered up with our customers throughout the years to develop the right and the best possible equipment, solutions, software, so that we can transform the way food is processed. But uh, maybe good that I show you just a very short video. It's one minute, but basically this is capturing the criticality of innovation. And also, I would say how much me and Marel have gained from working together and partnering up with the fishing industry, because situation and, and the surroundings are sometimes harsh. And that has been a very, very good environment to get good ideas, introduce new technology, and then introducing that same type of technology into further food processing. But the video says it's better in, in one minute than I can in many minutes. <laughs> Uh, with that being said, it's sometimes good when you go to a birthday party to take a look at some of the pictures that um, um, are related to the birthday boy or birthday girl, and we for sure did that when we were celebrating our 40 years of anniversary. Um, we were thinking ab a lot about what has changed and what has not changed so much throughout the years, and one of the things that we have seen change a lot is the number of people that are working in food processing and how much of automation has been introduced into the processing. And um, I have only been working for the company for eight years, but nevertheless, I have seen huge steps taken when it comes to further automation, more uh, artificial intelligence, more um, decisions that are made based on facts, not on feelings. And we are seeing basically the food industry taking huge steps forward. Many of our customers have talked about that there is just scarcity of labor. It has been for years, but after COVID, it is just like that there is not to be found the people that need to work in uh, some of the jobs that we have in food processing. And we must solve that with automation. Not talking about all jobs, 
but I'm talking about the jobs that we would call repetitive, not with the optimal ergonomics, and also the jobs that are but simply boring. Because nobody should be working in a job like that, we should solve that with automation and create more valuable jobs somewhere else. Uh, one of the things that has not changed, for sure, and that is that we need to have fun, and we need to be innovative. And these are two of the founders of the company. Uh, I sat next to one of them uh, uh, in my first year in Marel, and to say the least, it's still fun <laughs> to be in innovation, and it's still fun to develop together with our great partners in the fishing industry. Since uh, 40 years ago, we have uh, expanded into poultry and into meat, and it has been also amazing to take the great technology that has been developed into the fishing industry and introduce that into poultry and meat production globally. This is an investor slide, and you might ask, why are you showing an investor slide here? Like, uh, we are talking about innovation, sustainability, and everything like that. But I think it is important to also remind ourselves that when we are talking about sustainability, innovation and everything like that, it's so important to be open and to work together. And that is what I wanted to show with this slide. Uh, Marel did not do anything alone. We did everything that we are proud of today in partnership with our customers and by joining forces with great companies that have also started as a startup and later on, joint forces with Marel created even a better portfolio of solutions towards the fishing industry, the poultry industry, and meat industry, and now recently into plant-based uh, plant food as well. Also important to grow with your customers, so that is something that I wanted to show here. Uh, the yield of the fish fillet has grown a lot in these 40 years. Uh, we have seen the, that today you can have four, no, now I need to go a little bit back. In 1983, when we started the company, you needed four fish basically to feed as many as you need three fish to feed today. And as you were seeing in many of the slides uh, here earlier on, we don't stop there when it comes to feed, uh, fish processing because the rest, the 17% that are missing here, they are going into cosmetics. They are going into creating um, omega-3 oils and all kinds of byproducts, or some would even call that co-products today. Before I close this, I just wanted to show a, a short video <coughs> and um, basically representing the feed, uh, fish processing plant of today. Here we have standardized equipment that is easy to connect together. Every machine of the fish factory is basically working together. The flow is seamless. There are right decisions taken based on data throughout the processing from the beginning till the end. The managers or those that are responsible for the plants, they get an overview of everything is happening uh, on the dashboards that we are seeing here in front of us, they can intervene if they want, they can also decide that they want to stop production of uh, product A and go into product B and go into product C and so on and so forth. So basically, um, very much fun. If you have not been recently into a fish processing factory, I really recommend it. I do a lot of it. <laughs> With that being said, I think we move on to next agenda point. Thank you. So guys, we wanted to be really drastic and stand. It was a really a drastic move here, but we thought we were a little bit, we needed after the beer a little. Uh, but, uh, and you see the list of 
amazing people that are here. So I'm, I'm going to introduce them as we go up, go further. I would maybe like to uh, start with Keresis. Lisa, your amazing uh, background in medical, uh, in the medical profession. I'm still wondering, we, know you, we talk about uh, Keresis and its purpose in this world. What is it that basically, is it life changing you say? It is life changing, it's life saving actually. So Keresis has taken the skin from the fish that would previously been discarded and they're actually minimally processing it to turning it into a medical device that saves lives on a daily basis throughout the United States. But, but how is it basically, uh, you're moving from a medical profession into a seafood industry? <laughs> is that kind of as you see it or? So actually our founder um, came from, you know, he's from Iceland, he came from a fisherman family, the fisherman background, and um, through his uh, experience of noticing that the fish skin was um, discarded for quite some time, he, um, through his science and research, actually discovered that under the microscope, the human skin pore size is almost identical to the fish skin pore size, so therefore it can be used um, in a variety of ways um, in these hospitals to help save lives of these patients. And then being packed full of omega-3s and fatty acids in addition to that is exactly what the body needs to heal, so it covers all the bases to help these patients heal. Uh, moving maybe to Posted, you are not there. You are basically, you don't probably know it, guys, but he is the leader of research and the authority in maritime in Iceland. So I'm very pleased to have you here with us. I'm still wondering, we are so pleased to see what Einar is doing with American Seafood with all these big trawlers. Is the world going to be just big trawlers or do we still have small boaters all around? Well, <coughs> that's a question that is probably of political <laughs> origin. Uh, but yes, I think uh, I think we 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 have to have the variety of, of different uh, vessels that is uh, acting, uh, 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 not just f for taking out what what is allowed to cut, but also taking into account uh, the development in, for instance, using electricity, um, uh, small boats that are uh, are fishing close to the shore are are are, are, are indeed. Uh, there is a higher probability that, that they could use 100% electricity uh, of, of green sources uh, than than the than the big trawlers. Uh, you can never you can never run on, on batteries. Uh, you can you can run on on different fuels, but but batteries alone or 100% fuel from 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 electricity is only possible for a few hours at, at the best. So. Yeah. So Thorvald Tjörvi may be moving to you and Trackwell, which is a uh, fleet management. I'm wondering if you could just say in, in layman's terms, what has changed? What is fleet management now and what was it maybe 20 years ago? <coughs> yes, uh, well, a, a lot has changed. I mean, uh, the typical vessel monitoring systems uh, provided have been here for 30 years. Uh, and so what we're seeing now is that uh, our customers, which are authorities all around the world, uh, many European countries and uh, regional fisheries management organizations, uh, they are now asking for uh, uh, not only the monitoring of the vessels and the, the zones and the fishing gears and licenses, but they want all the fisheries data now coming into one system. And they want uh, the, the catch registries, they want all the, uh, the sales and, and everything to be in one place. And that means then that they can da mine the data, uh, they can uh, make uh, get, get better reporting, and uh, then move it over to the authorities to make the policies uh, accordingly. Uh, if they have to save some stock or 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 or, or, or increase stock in some in some cases, uh, we're also seeing a, a lot of. I mean, there's a, the AI factor is always a very sort of um, popular term now. However, we are seeing the capability of having AI now sort of analyze more vessel behavior, so we can have uh, predictive indicators of sort of strange behavior or typical behavior of vessels, and then have a risk analysis of what the vessels are doing and how they're behaving. So yeah, a lot of changes in okay. the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. Einar, I'm wondering, uh, as, a, as a CEO of American Seafood, pleased to have you, of course, like everybody else, but uh, your past is quite interesting as well. How was it to move from completely different food sectors into the seafood sector? 
if you maybe just describe that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think you and I, you know, should tell you guys that he was uh, down on my boat uh, yesterday, and I was there this morning, and they're like, ah, I met your fellow countryman, the, the tall, handsome Icelander. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing, and no, 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 I figured out it was, anyway. Yeah, it's been interesting. I, uh, I spent some time in, uh, in sort of the food business, and then this bubble tea thing, and I think that, you know, one of the things that frustrates me greatly about our industry is we have a great story to tell, and we suck at it. You know, and we, you know, we make some of the greatest, sustainable, nutritious product in the world, and nobody seems to know about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do a better job of. Mm -hmm. Great point. Inquar, if I move over to you, you have a long experience from Vice. Lisa has to leave. Just give her a good <laughs> hand. <I'm sorry. laughs> Just to make it. You have a long experience, of course, now in a, in a tech company, but what I'm wondering is that we sometimes would like to understand why there are so many startups coming out of our small country. Do you have any thoughts on that? How, how, why is the culture so deep? No, it's Keep it a little bit further close so we have everybody it's listening. difficult to say, but uh, generally speaking, we, 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 the Icelanders, we tend to like new things. Uh, and uh, in the seafood industry, I think, uh, the seafood industry as a whole is a little bit sort of old-fashioned in a way, but I think the Icelanders are pioneers in that sense. We've seen a lot of companies going from one boat up to huge operations. So, and if you go to the, to the IT part, uh, I think the same applies there. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, companies coming out of the universities and we are always seeking because we are island in the north. We like to travel and we like to explore the world. So I, th I think that is one of the drivers why we are in that position. Anna Christine, great presentation, thank you. Still in the small voters feeling here, uh, these production lines seems to be fitting very well with American seafood, but how do you see the, uh, you servicing the smaller processors that are in thousands, of course, in the world in the future? Or how do you do it today? Very good question. Very good question. Um, I would say if you think about Marel and what we are doing when it comes to processing of this, we really want to grow with our partners and our customers. So we are very proud of having the portfolio that can serve those that have maybe the lower throughput up to those that want to go full force automatic from beginning to end and uh, everything in between. But what is basically what we really want to emphasize today that we grow with our customers. Customers can come in, they maybe just need one discharge, one scale, let's start there and from there we can go into the future. That is why I was also emphasizing this that we grow together, <laughs> that there is a possibility to basically serve those that are smaller, just starting out, but also going into the end-to-end, -end full automatic uh, traceability and so on and so forth in the food processing industry. I'm still, kinda, as you have heard, I'm kind of obsessed with co-products. And I, I, my dream is always that Marel will provide the, all the whole thing so you, a fisherman can come in and he will say, I can do the fish skin into collagen, I can take the enzymes and extract that, etc." Is there a way to do that or is that too complicated, do you think? No, I, I absolutely also love that you use the word co-product because mm. it's a co-product. It's not a byproduct like we used to think about it in the past. Oh, now we take this that is not going into the supermarket and we call it a, a byproduct and it's uh, downscaled into 20% 20, 20 of the uh, price of the fillet or something like that. That is just not happening today. You saw the great uh, brands that we were uh, seeing in, in your presentation and we, you can for sure say that they, these are co-products. Uh, we are always becoming better and better, and now I'm not talking about Marel, but I'm talking about just the industry in general in finding new ways uh, how to use the things that do not end up on our dish and create something very valuable out of it. So that is something that I think uh, we are just seeing like a part of the opportunities that can be uh, further used into this end product and continue to use the 100% part of what we are basically bringing in from the sea. 
one thing that I really also, if I, if I can, <laughs> comment on uh, what uh, Einar was saying, because I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree that we think we have to be also better in sharing the story. We have a great product, fresh product, coming from the sea, protein, it's clean, it's traceable. Think about it, it's amazing what we have at our hands. Like the world needs to know about it. I know we all here today, <laughs> we know about it, but the world needs to know about it, how, how, how yeah, all the opportunities that come with it. Thorsten, within your organization, there is such a great pool of talent. I'm still wondering, it's like, because now lots of startups are actually seeking new talent. Are you having difficulty with an, oh, oh, government institution to hold on to this talent now when there are so many startups coming with new ideas that are actually offering shares and you know, stock, stocks, etc., to some of these super pe pe people? Definitely, definitely. And, and uh, all the, uh, well, at my institute, we are 180 uh, serving the industry in, the, in that sense or the nation uh, on all fields. So in a, in a country like ours, it's difficult to have education in, in, in for, mm. for all of those uh, professions that we need to, to fill in. Uh, and we have had problems, yes. Uh, and when it comes to competition with the industry, uh, when it comes to IT people, uh, programmers, etc., that is a huge problem for governmental uh, institute that has to be fitting into the mm to the uh, uh, to the union's uh, salary for <laughs> instance so that that's that's a part of it uh, uh, but again the the uh, there is a lot of possibilities uh, and we have uh, in our institute we have uh, 14 nationalities uh, 14 14 uh, from all over so we are we are importing a lot of knowledge uh, that support us in, in in our work so that's a very important for us yeah. Uh, in our, on the same note, I must tell you, I got this report from the uh, from your team. Uh, Labor, don't worry. It's the it's a sustainability report. Congratulations, the first first of its kind uh, from your side. Credit to my sustainable employee Tim, Tim in the back. You want to wave your hand? <laughs> it is a huge step. I'm still wondering how you are. Um, I, I learned from your staff that you are, of course, always treating the bycats as, more, as, more, as carefully as possible. But how, how do you, what, what are the next steps in that? What do you see, foresee? Well, some people have said I should make collagen blocks out of my fish skins. <laughs> uh, not, not name any, any people there. <laughs> not to name names. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that you know, we obviously are uh, effectively an industrial ingredient provider. We, all of our fish gets processed on board and frozen into what we call block. Uh, you will see that coming from our partner customers as the filet of fish at McDonald's and the same thing with the shirimi. Uh, the fish meal and oil, which are formerly byproducts, now co-products or key products, mm -hmm. ended up initially in a lot of uh, uh, aquaculture uh, feed and farming, and now it's more and more into pet food. And we are clearly seeing a huge rise in, in higher margin application of pet food and often the pet food manufacturers specifications are more stringent than the human feed uh, manufacturers. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> uh, maybe you got a little bit on the, the green accounting, of course, in layman's terms, because it's kind of difficult. You, yeah. you are with that. That's your specialty. What is green accounting and how can it honestly help? Because we're sometimes, sometimes sustainability of the green things to, uh, tends to be uh, more words than action. Absolutely. Can we make sure that it's action? Absolutely. I think uh, green accounting or the carbon footprint is something we are hearing more of every day. Uh, some of the companies are, are doing this already, uh, basically in a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, but what we are doing within our system is to keep track on all variety of the carbon footprint uh, from oil consumption, wear and tear of nets, uh, usage, usage of plastic, and we have this all within the system, whether it's in the finance or in the production, so we can uh, help the customer to put this in the invoice or, or even a QR code on the product so you can follow and see how much carbon print this filet or fish has, uh, has uh, put after. Yeah. Yep, good. 
voluntarily. Maybe a little bit what would be interesting. I, I learned yesterday about your the story of Trackwell, which I think is a part of the culture that we're, we've been talking about so much today. Tell us a little bit about the, the beginning of, of Trackwell. Yes, uh, so when the Icelandic Coast Guard needed a vessel monitoring system, uh, they turned to the University of Iceland, who recommended five engineering students who were brought aboard uh, to develop the solution. And once the, that, that project was over, they had a, a fully uh, fledged vessel monitoring system, and they started the company around that product and started selling it. And uh, today we have multiple, we're serving as vessel monitoring providers to uh, multiple countries around the world, Australia, uh, Cyprus, Greece, uh, just to name a few, and uh, a lot of regional fisheries organizations. So um, yeah, from that started in 1996, uh, and, and they've, they've moved on and, and become a very sort of staple uh, company in the Icelandic fishing is industry. Can I just follow yeah. up on, on, on his, his story? Because uh, Trackwell and others have been developing uh, also information that is used by the science, for instance, the logbook, logbooks uh, that was uh, written in the first years, but in the later years it has been electronically. Uh, and I just wanted to give you an example of how we can use that kind of information, and that is associated with, with the management of our resource. Uh, that I might come into later if, I, if I, I, I'm allowed, but just an example uh, taking uh, the trawler, and I'm, 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 I'm using that, that as, a, as, a, as an example of how uh, responsible management and, 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 and responsible uh, harvesting uh, can, can lead to an increase in cuts per unit of effort. Uh, we, ha we are with our trawler fleet, we fished in 1993 uh, uh, about 150,000 tons of cod, our most valuable species. We used over 400,000 hours that were counted in the logbook system to cut them. In 2016, 2019, when we had a much better, uh, the stock in much better uh, condition, we, we, are, we have been fishing around 140, 60,000 tons in, 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 uh, to, since 2016. We are spending less than 200,000 hours uh, fishing those. That is in addition to, to what you were uh, presenting in your slides. In your, in Why your didn't slide. I know this stuff? Why are we no, not I, talking? Do we need to go to Seattle to <laughs> get this information? But this is on the top of what you were presenting. Yeah, it's so really that interesting. That is, I had no idea. That is how we can, we can yeah. monitor. And yeah. that's so important to illustrate that yeah. the development in the, and the technology and responsible utilization of our resources can lead to uh, much less emissions if that is, is, is something that we are measuring, Brilliant. and which is very important as yeah. well. Plus, if we take it all the way, the impact on the bottom is very is, is only half of what it was uh, with those trawlers that were fishing in '93 yeah. for the same cuts, and that's also important. That's a huge one. Uh, and maybe a little bit about the the the, um, the people on board and the sort of the age. How is it for you to get new people, or young people, to join the force? Uh, I think in my business, as every business, talent is key. And I think just to follow up on some of the comments said before, I think one of the reasons for this Silicon Valley type model in Iceland is that the Icelandic fishing industry has been very profitable. And that enables it to invest not only in technologies and startups, and the startups have a runway to get to scale, but also in people. And part of the big part of, of the industry, or the challenge of the industry in other countries is its lack of profitability Hence, it does not attract the talent you want. With us in particular, especially on the vessels, uh, you know, I have a, I can't remember, it's like 40 different countries. Uh, you know, obviously, they all have to be U.S. Uh, uh, legal papers uh, to work on the boats, uh, but uh, it, it's quite a, a challenge, and I often say that, you know, when you go into crew up, like there are now some of them are leaving tonight, that more in the beginning of January, you go in the galley and you meet them and you see sort of the greenhorns, you know, the first time out, and they're all, you know, I mean, you're gonna love this, or you're gonna fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That was a fisherman's talk. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then you sort of get the two to three-year people, and they, they usually will stay on uh, until they get a life event. You know, they want to have a 
baby or find a partner or something like that, and then they usually take some time off. Then when you get to people sort of five plus, that's there at keepers. Yeah. Uh, and they stay on. And I think that we are trying to map out better, you know, what are the people that like the lifestyle mm. and, and want to stay with us? Because I mean, it's unique. I mean, you, you work really hard, but you only maybe work seven or eight months of the year. Yeah. You can live wherever you want, but, you know, seven eight months of the year, you're living on a boat, you're working, you know, almost 24 by seven, and so on and so forth. So it's quite unique. We are trying to do things to uh, uh, attract and retain talent. Uh, we have now put uh, Starlinks on all of our vessels. So people can call home and communicate with their families and I often want to make this cheesy headline, you know, when you're with American Seafoods, you're far away, but you're close to family and friends. And yeah. HR doesn't like it, but anyway, but that's kind of the, so we're trying to do that. We're trying to create career paths. You know, we had a guy uh, leave uh, last week uh, who literally started in the fish hold on loading boxes, is now captain on his virgin journey. So we're trying to create the career path and invest in their education and training. Both here in Seattle and also when they're off uh, time, they, you know, live in Texas, we find courses there for them to take uh, and try to make it cool. And we're working with high schoolers to say, because we need people, like in America, everybody needs to go to college. Yeah. Not everybody wants to go to college. Mm -hmm. Can't afford to go to college. It's not interesting. We need, like, you know, trade people, right? You know, welders and safety people and ladder techs and whatever else. So we're trying to work with some of the high schools and the different can't remember that it's uh, called Core Plus, Marine Core Plus. So it's a program where we send people into the high schools, we tell them what we do, and give them an alternative career path. And, uh, and that's sort of you know, something we need to change in America in particular to try to create more, you know, that it's okay to be a tradesman kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's a challenge for all of us, and we are very much focused on it and trying to work on it and you know, improve the quarters and improve the food and, and all those kind of things. So. Mm -hmm. Anna, I know you are with a listed company but you're among friends here, so we can be off the record. <laughs> is there anything on the, in the, on the horizon? Of course, what's interesting is you're moving into green now. Is there anything that, that comes to mind, especially in that area? Is that the area that you think you will grow the fastest now? Or You mean, if, when you say go into green, that is the plant-based? Uh, plant-based. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Definitely, we, we like look at us as consumers. Look at us just to go into the, uh, the supermarket or go into restaurants and so on and so forth. Um, I think many of us are flexitarian, so you do not have to go like extreme into only meat or only one, uh, what to say, one type of food or one category. But it is uh, becoming more interesting to experiment a little bit. And we are seeing that just in general when it comes to, could, comes to food. Uh, we thought this was a great opportunity to join forces with a great company called Wenger that has been uh, focusing on uh, plant-based food. So really now we can proudly say that we are in all proteins, so poultry, meat, fish, and, and plant-based. Um, what also, if I, if I can build on that a little bit, uh, you, you stop me if, I, if I'm going too far. But uh, what is really beneficial in being in all four proteins is the knowledge that can be transferred between these industries. Uh, what has been very special over the 40 years that I was just covering earlier on about Marel uh, is that um, the fishing industry is very, I would say, technology driven, very innovative, very open to new things. So I was not joking when I said like well, you have to go into a fish plant because basically there is so much automation, there is so much ongoing that I did not have an idea about before I joined forces with Marl. And I wrote my master thesis about quality in food production. But when I came into a fishing plant and saw x-rays, water jet cutters, everything automatically packed and things happened just so quickly, it was amazing, absolutely, and you basically get inspired to uh, really, what to say, participate in this journey. And this technology, these cutting machines, this uh, robots and everything that we have been seeing and adapting into the food industry, into the fish industry, is some, then something that we can take further and introduce into other proteins. Vice versa, we in fish can learn so much more from for example, how poultry, how they have been uh, uh, working with speed and working with throughput and so on and so forth. So th that is also the beauty 
of having all four proteins is that the, there is always something to learn from each other and benchmark, which is always pushing the boundaries. That is what, uh, what I really, really love in my day-to-day -day job. This was absolutely great final word, I think. I appreciate uh, the panelists, great talks, and uh, if there are any questions, we have a networking session outside after this, after the, the session that's coming up, but let's give them all. <laughs>